we sing of the wonders of your wonderful love. Lord, truly, it is a joyous time. But Lord, for us as Christians, every day is an exceeding joy because we have you. Lord, you have been born into the world and you reign in our hearts forever. And we praise you for that. And we ask today that you would open our hearts to your word and all that you would desire to teach us, Lord. We love you and we thank you for the privilege to, to be here and to gather in your name. And it is truly in the name of Jesus that we come. Amen. Please be seated. All right. Well, this is the week. This is the week that I hope you realize and understand, first of all, that it was Constantine in 313 that dedicated December 25th to be the day of celebration regarding the birth of Jesus Christ. Prior to that announcement by Constantine, emperor of the known world at that time, there was no really celebration by the Christian church going on. What happened during that period of time is that for thousands of years, paganism had celebrated what is called Saturnalia. And they celebrated it during this week that we are in right now. In fact, yesterday being the first day of winter, today, the 22nd, being the shortest day of the year, what the pagans would do is on this day take an evergreen tree and they would dedicate gifts and wealth to that tree, literally tying gifts onto the tree, and they would sacrifice on this day, the 22nd, literally, of uh, December, and they believe that in that worship service, the life of the evergreen tree, in its consumption by the flames, would rise up into the heavens, and it would give the sun new life, and they noticed that when they did that, December 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, and onward, the sun, the days began to lengthen out. And so they believed that their sacrifice was being accepted by their pagan gods. Well, when Constantine established the church and the state as one together, the Christian church, he made a decree, he issued that on December 25th, Jesus Christ would be worshipped. And that through that worship, of his birth and all, that Saturnalia would be gone away. But it's not exactly gone away completely. Today, maybe after service, you're going to run, maybe tomorrow, like me, you will run to purchase those last final gifts, or maybe, like me, begin your Christmas shopping. And you'll embark upon this tremendous quest and venture, and uh, you will put a lot of care and a lot of effort into getting that special gift that you hope, when you give it to that one that you love or care about, makes a difference in their life. Well, the same is true for the recipient. For so many in the world, so many people, certainly children, this is a great time of the year. They are looking for the receiving of a gift that is going to make this year worth living. I saw going home last night from the church here a sign out on the poll that said, if you want a Buzz Lightyear action figure, call me. And there's a phone number. Now, I didn't know Buzz was a big deal, but I asked my kids last night, what's the hot deal? And they said, well, anything regarding Buzz Lightyear is a big thing. Well, you know, um, I asked Ashley, I said, what if you're a little girl? And she says, well, uh, nothing compares to the newborn baby beautiful. I mean, you got to have her. And uh, kids, I don't know how you were at Christmas time, but I could not go to sleep Christmas Eve. Uh, you know, I was like wired. And I don't know how you were before Christmas, but I was terrible. I would take the gifts, I would rattle them. Did you do that or was it just me? You'd shake them. I would hold it up. I had it down. You could hold some certain wrapping, especially if they were bought at Pick and Save. You can see right through the wrapping. You hold up the wrapping, turn on a light, and you could almost read what was inside or behind the wrapping. I would also study the boxes of things at the stores, Toys R Us and other stores. I could figure out the size, and I'd go home, and I learned to measure with certain parts of my hand, I must be getting that thing that I had asked for. 
And uh, I used to make my mother so upset that she would try to keep back the important gifts because I would wind up shaking them into pieces, trying to decipher what is this. Get a stethoscope out there, you know, and trying to figure it out. Why? Because we are all looking for a gift that is going to make a difference both as a giver and as a receiver. We want to make a difference, and we also really want to be given a gift that makes a difference. True story. Picked it up Friday on the Internet. one 800 for bad gift. If you get, they said, a bad gift for Christmas, you can dial 1-800 for bad gift and you can put that gift that you received and the giver of its name around the world and display their bad gift. If you get a bad gift, you can turn the giver in on the internet this year. How do you like that? That's why for me, you'll get nothing. I think that's pretty low. People are so bent on getting the right gift. Now, I don't know how you are about this, but I certainly know how I am. My opinion about what gift or gifts I need probably varies from your opinion about what gift I need. You see, the gift I need is the gift I want. You might look at me and say, Jack, you need new pants. I may think my pants are fine. It's not a want. It's not a need. But you see, pr perhaps truthfully, and you'll get that right gift, you see. Not me. I want. And so that becomes my need. And your observation is probably more correct than my want. And the same goes for you. Oh, honey, if you just get me this. Oh. Well... I may really truly need something very, very different than that. But you see, listen carefully. This will really make a spiritual point in the end. What you want and what you need most often are two different things. You may be thinking that whatever period of time you are in your life, gee, I'm 40 years old, so I think right about now I ought to be having a one of these or a one of those. Well, I'm 21, and I think I ought to have, well, you know what? I'm 67, and I think I've earned this, whatever it might be. You see? And so it depends on where we're at. But why don't you grab your Bible this morning and turn to John chapter 3, and we're going to read briefly verses 14 to 17 and look at what God's opinion is about giving the perfect gift. And this service this morning might be unlike any other service you've ever been to. Now, I'm not saying because of any oratory skills, because I have none. It may not be because of our awesome stained glass windows, because we have none. Uh, it may not be because of the beautiful, sunshiny, warm weather. We have none today. But the message may be different and unlike any other message that you've ever heard before, because by the end of this morning, you will be faced with the decision to receive a gift or not before you leave this church today. And you may be thinking, well, you know, there's nothing that you can say to me or there's nothing that I can think that's new. Well, I want to challenge you because by the time you come to the end of this service, you will experience something on the inside of your life. You'll feel it on the inside of your heart and you'll be faced with a decision about Jesus Christ. Will you receive him as the gift that God offers or will you not? And God, according to the Bible, demands that we make a decision regarding his offer of the free gift of life through Christ. But it must be received. And so in John chapter 3, verse 14, we'll read through it and come back. Jesus said to Nicodemus, we'll talk about him in a moment. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now the giving of a gift requires the efforts of one who's going to purchase that gift. All of you in this room, safe to say, is 
purchased a gift or maybe more, and you are going to extend that gift in a matter of days. And this is the most amazing thing because the gift giver positions him or herself in a very vulnerable place, don't we? Will they like it? In fact, we'll call them up on December 26th. Did you like it? It means something to us. It means something to us if it meant something to them. Do you care? Oh, this is all I got, or this is whatever. Have you ever seen a kid at Christmas, a spoiled kid, a kid like us? Before Christmas, you're looking at what name tags? Your sister's name tags? No way, you're looking at your name tags. This one's got my name on it. And then you move them over to one part of the room, and there you are. And you get yourself ready for diving under that tree on Christmas morning. And you know what happens? You open up, and the wrapping going, and everything's flying, and out comes the... Tickle me Elmo. <laughs> oh, neat. Out goes the box, over goes the toy, and what do they reach for? The next box. Until they've opened up 10 or 12 or 15 boxes, and then they say, is that it? I mean, is that all there is? And you know as a parent that they'll start focusing on the toys that they got, but what happens a week later? Little tickle me elbow, El Elmo, <laughs> elbow, I got a tickle in my elbow. Little tickle me Elmo is sitting out in the yard somewhere underneath the sprinkler now, a week later, right? Oh, Daddy, if I just had a tickle me Elmo. Hey, listen, you see the news? They're going for a thousand bucks. Somebody down in San Diego is offering a tickle me Elmo for thirty-four hundred dollars. Hottest Christmas item going. Hey, I want a tickle me Elmo. I could pay off my mortgage with that little guy. I'll sell him. But the moment you get it, out it goes because people are not appreciating. God has sent his gift to the earth. Have we appreciated him? Listen, are you qualified to answer the question just yet? Can you say this morning, yes, I appreciate him? Well, wait a minute. To appreciate the gift given by God named Jesus Christ, it presupposes that you've listened to his word. It presupposes you're obeying him. What does the Bible say about what he's speaking to us here? If you look past the veneer and think about it for a moment, this passage that we just read, it's dear to our hearts, my goodness, verse 16. If you ever watched an NFL game, you know it well. John 3, 16. But what's behind the story here? Listen, these few verses presupposes and assumes that man is lost because it says here that God sent his son that we could have everlasting life meaning if we do not receive his son, we do not have everlasting life. Are you aware of that? Are you aware of the fact that somebody had to die? Are you aware of the fact that God sent his son into the world, and what did the world do to him? The world killed him, but it was according to God's word. Why? Somebody had to die. And Christmas is the celebration of the birth of, of the Messiah. What does the word Messiah mean? One who will save us. And it took a death. The baby born by Mary had to die. The prophets foretold that Jesus would come and be born and live and die the death. But of course, three days later, rise from the dead. But let's look at Jesus' opening statements. Look at verse 2 of this chapter. It says that there was a man that came to Jesus... His name is Nicodemus, verse 1 tells us. And he says to Jesus in verse 2, Rabbi, that is teacher or master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for nobody can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. I believe Nicodemus meant that sincerely. I believe that's why he came to Jesus by night. Not that he was afraid, I don't think, but because the crowds had settled down and the masses had gone home and Nicodemus came when both him and Jesus had time to think Christian, and those who are here this morning, maybe you're a Muslim this morning or something, and you're here, listen, think, all of us think this morning. Who is this man, Nicodemus? If we do a little research about him, we find out, first of all, that he was the teacher of Israel. He was a man that held such a power of religious position that the nation that God had chosen as the nation and people of the world he was the man that the nation looked to for answers. When Nicodemus spoke, it was power. 
Nicodemus would be equivalent today to the Protestants? Someone like a Billy Graham. If you're Russian in here today, maybe someone like the Patriarch or the Metropolitan and the Russian Orthodox Church. If you're Catholic today, he would be equivalent to the Pope and how he's lifted up and looked at. Nicodemus is no small player. He comes to Jesus and he says, we know that you've come from God. And what does Jesus say? Thank you very much. It's so great of a man of your position to recognize my abilities. Jesus cuts to the chase just like he does in all of our lives. Jesus says in verse 3, most assuredly or absolutely or listen here, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Who's he saying it to? He's saying it to a man that, first of all, fasted twice a week. Do you? Do I? He's saying it to a man who prayed at least three hours a day. Do you? Do I? He's saying it to a man who gave at least one-tenth of all he owned. In fact, according to tradition, Nicodemus would have given 23% of his gross income to God. Do you? Do I? So before we pit our righteousness, our goodness, against God's demands and decrees, or even against Nicodemus, let's face up to the fact that this man is much more greater than any of us here this morning. He is a great man. And we would be humbled in the presence of Nicodemus. He thought he was loving God with all of his heart. He was going through the traditions that his people had established. But had God established them? No. Nicodemus had missed it. Jesus went on to say to him, you must be born again. Nicodemus said in verse 4, how can a man who's old enter again into his mother's womb and be born a second time? And we need to be challenged this morning. Is that how you're thinking? Earthly thoughts, like, in, like Nicodemus is thinking, earthly thoughts. He is a man who's to know spiritual things. Jesus says, and the word born again simply means this in the original language in the Greek, Born from above. Nicodemus, unless you're born from above, you will not see the kingdom of God. And he says, how can you get inside your mommy's womb again and come out a second time? I'm an old man. He wasn't joking. He was sincerely asking a question, and he saw the seriousness in the heart and the eyes of Jesus. And Jesus goes on to tell him. He says in verse 7, don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Verse 10, he says, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Nicodemus, you should be thinking on spiritual levels, not earthly, carnal, simple levels of this world. And so Jesus raises Nicodemus's thinking about God and how to get to God. Jesus raises him up. Jesus doesn't necessarily come down to where he's at and meet him at his traditions. Jesus always challenges us to come up to where he's at and he says, you will not, listen, he says it today to all of us, we will not see heaven unless we are born from above. That's why Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. We'll see more about this as we come through this message this morning. Jesus earlier on said in Matthew 5, 20, For I say to you that unless, listen, that unless your righteous acts and deeds exceeds the righteous acts and deeds of the scribes and Pharisees, men like Nicodemus, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what on earth is he saying? Jesus said, unless your righteousness is greater than these guys, you're not going to make it. And everybody who heard Jesus say that, threw up their shoulders to their ears and dropped them back down and felt like turning around and walking back home because who can be good enough? He's challenging us. Wait a minute. If he tells Nicodemus that he's got to be born again to get into the kingdom of God, and then he turns around and says that my righteousness has got to be more than Nicodemus's, how do we get in? I know, I know. Give money to the church. No, keep your money. God says, uh-uh. Join the choir. No. Last Sunday, I was in the chapel of the guards across the street from Buckingham Palace for the Sunday morning service. 4,000 people. 
And when, those, when that choir began to sing, I had to cry. I thought angels had invaded the whole sanctuary. It sounded so angelic. Certainly, they get into heaven. No, Jesus says no. When the lieutenant colonel of the queen's army read from the scriptures and bellowed out in his beautiful English accent the gospel of John and proclaimed the good news of Christ, surely that man in front of 4,000 people surely must be acceptable to God. After all, he read the Bible and he did his thing. Jesus says no. We enter the kingdom of God through receiving the Christmas gift by faith. Not by any works of our own, and we'll see this from the Bible this morning, and you'll do well today not to believe a word I say, but to write down every scripture verse I give you to see these things are not true. But one thing I want you to look at this morning, there'll be a few things, but one thing I want you to jot down in your notes is that we need to give the proper gift. Certainly. And God thinks the same way. God gave the proper gift. He says in verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. What on earth can that mean? Well, you know what? It literally means nothing to us if we don't know why Jesus stated it. Why did he bring up Moses? My goodness, he had been dead for thousands of years. Why did Jesus bring up the raising of a serpent up on a pole? What is that all about? What a strange verse. Nicodemus would have known exactly what it meant. So listen, put your sandals on and your robe and grab a donkey and some sunblock. We'll go back to the wilderness with Moses and we'll think about something that's recorded in Numbers chapter 21. The people were being blessed by God. The, Israel nation was almost three million strong. Moses, their leader, what a job. God was blessing their victories. God was blessing them with food and putting a, a spiritual cloud over them to shelter them from the sun and to warm them at night with a pillar of fire. God was taking care of them, and they were so blessed on their pilgrimage journey to the promised land. And you know what happens? When people are so blessed, they do the same thing that a nation called America is doing. They do so often the same thing our kids do. They do so often the things that we do. They, what? Whine and complain. And they started whining and complaining in Numbers chapter 21. And they began to accuse. Because, you know, think about it. When you whine and whine and whine and whine, you only whine for so long and then you go into the attack mode. I, this is, it's hot in here. Why is it hot? It's so hot in here. Are you guys hot? It's, oh, it's really hot up here. <laughs> it's hot. It's hot. And then it reaches a level to where it goes. Well, why don't they pay their air bill or something or turn on the air conditioning? Or why don't they, you know, whose idea? And then wait, well, who's in charge? Where's the head usher anyway? The whining goes to attacking. The people began to whine, and eventually they began to attack Moses and attack God, and their rebellion, their sin, brought to them judgment. Does God run around saying, I can't wait for you to step out of line? No, he loves you unconditionally. But because God is holy, when we step out of line, we reap of being rebellious. It has nothing to do with God. It has to do with us reaping what we've sowed. Let's remember that next time something happens. God, why are you doing this to me? I, I, I didn't do it at all to you. I, you are the one that stuck your fork in the light socket. I... You see, we're so quick to be in a whiny mode and then immediately attack God for the perils and situations that are going on in our lives. And they did that. They were just like us. We're just like them. They did that. And it says that God sent to them, because of their sin, God sent to them fiery serpents that bit them. But with the judgment, God also said, Moses, tell them that if a snake bites them in the wilderness in the foot and they'll start to die, you take this serpent, make it out of brass, which means judgment in the Bible, put it on a pole and raise it up real high and tell all the people, look at the snake on a pole and they'll be made healed, whole, healed, healed, whole, completely. They'll be made perfect, fine. 
Now look, Moses stands up in front of the people. He says, all you guys have sinned. You're a bunch of whiners. Because of your whining, God's sending judgment because he's holy. You've whined, and you're going to get what you want or what you're whining for or what it equates to. But with the judgment, he's going to provide deliverance. Just look to the pole. Look to the tree holding up the snake. Everybody have that? No problem, right? What would you do if you got bit by one of those snakes? How many of you, this is a test to see if you're sleeping yet, how many of you would, with that instruction, look to the pole so that you would live? Why don't you raise your hand? A lot of you are sound asleep. I think if I got bit by this snake that's going to take my life and the remedy is look to the pole and live, I would look to the pole and live. You're a fool if you don't. And so God says, look to the pole and live. That's why Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up too. And that begins an interesting logic, an interesting process of thinking. So follow with me. Think about this for a moment. What do you want for Christmas? Okay, now what do you need? How is your life? Is Jesus' words only written in red because it's from him and it's in a book that's very ancient and old and has no application to you and I today? Listen, what we need is the true gift of Christmas in our lives. And just because you're here today on this Christmas Day celebration doesn't mean that you have it. Going to church every Sunday or once a year doesn't give it. Let's remember what the Word says to us. Let's realize what we need. And this is the aim for the giving of the gift. Not only did God give the right purpose in verse 14, but look at the aim for the giving of this gift, Jesus Christ. He says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. People, this verse, this is the word of God. He is implying that we are perishing. Now, you look cute today. I even wore a tie. But the Bible tells us that until we come to Jesus personally, we are perishing. You don't like to hear that. I didn't like to hear it when I first heard it. That's what the Bible teaches. That's why God sent his gift. Well, why should I perish? Um, I'm pretty good. We often hear that. I'm pretty good. Well, listen, think. Pretty good in relation to whom? Into what? Now, look, all of us judge. You might say, I don't need Jesus. I'm pretty good. Pretty good according to whom? Well, according to me. Okay, so you're the standard. Yeah. Well... What if Nicodemus walked in the room? Oh, well, he's certainly better, but I'm surely not as bad as the guy that lives next door to me. And you know, I'm not nearly as bad as Uncle Bud. You see, God doesn't grade on the curve. What's the highest in the class? An 88. Okay, well, we'll make it, you know, 66, 88. 66 to 88, that'd be an A. Oh, not God. God says, this is my law. It's called the Ten, the Big Ten. And it's not a football conference. It's a, the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten. And he says, if you've ever loved anything other than God, you have broken the very first commandment. And if you think of them like ten links on a chain, you might say, well, I've never committed adultery. So I've made it through that one. I love God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. I've made it through that one. Well, then it says, thou shalt not lie. Mm. And if you still think you've made it through that one, Jesus comes along and says, it's not the outward performance of breaking the law. Jesus says, if you think the thought, you've broken the law. So how many links in that chain do you have to break before you fall? You only need one to break. That's why the Bible says if you break one of the laws of God, you break them all. And you say, well, doggone, we're not doing very good. 
If our righteousness has got to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, if I've got to be better than Nicodemus to get in there, if I've broken one of the laws of God, how on earth are we ever going to get into heaven? Well, it depends if you accept the gift or not. At the end of the message, that's going to be given to you. But the Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. All means all. It says again in the Bible, Therefore, by the means of man's attempts at the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law comes the knowledge of sin. We've said to you before, but it bears repeating. Hang in there. You've heard it so much. We can be so right on that we can be like that perfect glass of arrowhead water taken right out of the mountain, but if I put three drops of cyanide crystal in it, stir it up, you can't see that poison in there, but it'll kill you dead. Just three drops. If I only put two drops in that beautiful water, it will still kill you dead. If I put one drop in that water, it will kill you dead. So how many sins do we have to commit in our lifetime before we become a sinner? One drop. That's why the Bible says that we all have fallen short. That's why the scripture says there's none that does good. No, not one. Wow, that's strong stuff. Jesus has come to set us free from all this if we come the way and the path that he has prescribed. If we come in the way and in the path that he has prescribed. People, this week uh, we were in, uh, with the outreach, we are in Siegen, Germany. You know that. And so many of you were praying, and God did a tremendous work there. We'll talk about it next week and have the people share a tremendous thing. And, uh, you know, we had to rent our own vehicles, right? We had to, we had to rent our vehicles, and, and so uh, I was one of the drivers. I didn't plan on being one of the drivers, but when we were picking up these cars at the airport, the guy said, well, your name was on the reservation and something, and you have to drive. And I just thought, well, I don't want to, but... Okay, well, that was a blessing in disguise because it totally slipped my thinking that there's no speed limits in Germany. I loved it. I was having the time of my life. And if anything, the people in my vehicle learned to pray without ceasing. We were moving. Now, this was a, uh, we had a, we had a, a, a European version, a German version of a Volkswagen van which had to have a rocket engine in this thing. I mean, I had, we had the speedometer pegged at 180 kilometers, which is about 100 and close to 130 or 25. And we're just having, you know, we're singing and praying. And the people, I look in the mirror and everybody in the back seat's like, <laughs> well, you think you're moving until you see the lights flashing behind you and it's a Porsche going who knows how fast. But man, it was fun. And I feel the Lord calling me to Germany now. That's the place. But uh, Terry told me, he said, now when you do come into an area where there's either ice on the bridge or they suspect it or whatever, they'll, they'll post a, a speed limit. So listen, I am just carefree and foot down. And then up ahead I see this red and white sign and it is a, it is a sign saying to slow to 120, 120 uh, kilometers. That's like, what, 95 or something? I don't know what it is. You know, just walking speed. <laughs> and, uh, and so the moment you do that, and he said, you know, whatever you do, don't break that limit because they will nail you. I mean, you can, go, you can go all out, but the moment they post it, you better watch it. Listen, people live all out, foot down, all the way. Let's go for it, baby. And God posts a law and he says, thou shalt not. And all of a sudden you slam on the brakes, at least you're supposed to. And you come screeching almost to the wall. But you don't stop in time and you break the wall. And you're guilty. I'm guilty. There's no knowledge of sin until God posts the law, you see. And God did post the law. And look, this doesn't count. I can't see the law. I never saw it, officer. There was a vine hanging in front of that speed limit sign. No, that doesn't work. 
Sometimes they paint the speed limit on the ground. And God says, I've painted the law in every heart of man. You know. Little Junior knows when he's blowing it. He knows. God said, I've written my law in their hearts. So we need Jesus. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We need him because we are perishing. Verse 16, the value of the gift itself. This is the value of the gift. Verse 16, for God so loved, and in my Bible I've got the world scratched out, and I've got my name in it. You can do the same thing, and your Bible will even in fact be more applicable to you because for God so loved you, you personally. That's amazing. Isn't it amazing that God would love us at all? He's nuts about us. It's funny when somebody has a little baby. You know, a little baby comes out, and that thing, that thing's ugly, unless it's your baby. And isn't he just the cutest? Well, he's fine. You know, here. And then the little guy messes up. You know, here, take him back. And even to the parents, it's like, oh, look, he messed his bed. <laughs> they love him. God loves you more than that. God, he just took my cookie. God loves the accuser and the accused. We can't point our fingers. Nicodemus walked away from Jesus Christ, never pointing a finger again. If you read the Gospels carefully, you see how he's defending Christ through the Gospel of John. And later in the end, Nicodemus takes down with his friend Joseph the body of Jesus from the cross and buries him in a tomb. This man had a changed heart when he said to him, for God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that he gave, and you can almost see Jesus point to his robe, he gave his only glorified, as the word begotten, son, that whosoever would, the word is cling to, trust and rely upon, sit down in to him, would not perish, but have experience, live in the realm of everlasting life. Do you have it today? The Bible says these things were written that you may know that you have everlasting life. Do you know it today? You better not be thinking, well, I hope to know someday. If that's your thinking... It's against the Bible. The Bible says in 1 John, you are to know it now. Well, I don't think anybody can know it. Well, you need to read your Bible. We, I, am going to heaven based upon what Christ has done, and I know it now. And I know I'm not worthy to get in there, but I know that he died on the cross for me. And he has set me free. And like it or not today, the meaning of Christmas Christmas, Christ Mass, the gathering to worship of Christ. And I wonder this morning how many hypocrites there are here today. I think about how much I fail at worshiping Christ, but I think about this. 
Christmas. People are out buying gifts. Are they doing what? Christmas or are they doing Saturnalia? Huh? Are you a Darwinian? Are you an evolutionary biologist? What are you celebrating? How dare you buy a gift for someone? Unless you give it in the name of Saturnalia. This is Christmas. It's exclusive. It's for those who gather Mass to worship Christ. Or it's Saturnalia. The pagan worshiping of the sun god, Ra. Well, what are you doing? Well, I'm an atheist. I came here today because I'm getting taken to Mimi's afterwards. You didn't buy, I hope you're not, if you're an atheist, I sure hope you're not expecting any gifts for Christmas, are you? You wouldn't want to dare be a hypocrite. Because you don't believe in God, and it is Christ Mass. And yet the people around the world are worshiping something today or this week. Serious thing. Just some food for thought. We'll run through this quickly. Christmas. Think about it. In Isaiah 9, 6, 3,000 years ago, Isaiah said, Unto us a child is born, prophetically speaking. And then he says, Unto us a son is given. I can understand a child being born, but a son given. How do you know that? And the governments will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That was written 3,000 years ago. Listen to this. By the same prophet 3,000 years ago, Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore, I, the Lord, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God is among us. That was written 3,000 years ago. Mary had that little lamb. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, written 2,000 years ago. For in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in human form. That's what the Bible says about Jesus, this gift that we are to be worshiping at Christmas and every day of our lives. Micah 5, 2, written 2,400 years ago. O Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of towns of Judah, yet out of you shall he come forth to me whose goings forth have been from of old, even everlasting. The word in the Hebrew is eonio, eonios, eternal, never having a beginning or an ending, is this little boy that's to be born. He, in fact, is eternal. 2,000 years ago, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, but when the time was right... God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Which leads us to this fourth point, and we'll conclude with one more here in a moment, the enjoyment of the gift itself. Look at this. Look at verse 17. It says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He's not a policeman waiting for you to break that speed limit. God didn't set you up to knock you down. He doesn't bowl with people in a big, gigantic, cosmic ball to run you over. He's on your side, and all of your life, maybe you've been running from him, trying to do your own thing, and you've made it pretty good. You've done pretty well. But you can't save yourself. And nothing is enjoying anymore. Rarely does anything bring you enjoyment because you and I have been engineered in such a way that this life can bring us no meaning ultimately without a personal relationship with this gift. I don't know about you, but I appreciate gifts I can touch. There's a few gifts that you've got to keep under glass but I like gifts I can play with. And don't tell anybody, but in my office, when I go places and I see something like, I, I, like the, I like airplanes, you know that, and so I'll buy these at the airports. They have great model, 
great models of these airlines. So we got like KLM and Aeroflot and Delta and Alitalia and these neat planes, and they're, bo they're on my credenza. And they're there, and you, you, know, you, you don't touch them. You're not supposed to touch them. You're supposed to look at them. Well, when I'm supposed to be studying the Bible, just to make sure that they can still fly, I'll take them off the stand and take them around my office. <laughs> Especially that big 747 KLM. It's beautiful. Just as it flies by my picture of Noah's Ark. It's just a neat thing. I do that. I want to touch this. I want, listen, give me a gift I can touch. Don't put it behind glass. Isn't it awesome that Jesus came down here among us? John said, hey, it's him. Our eyes have seen him. Our hands have handled him. We have felt and handled the word of life, Jesus Christ. I thank God that he came among us. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That word abundantly means having a lot of it and a good one. A good life. The Bible says concerning Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word. And this is not the beginning of God. This is the beginning of physical time. At the creation. At the creation was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Oh, you got two and then one. Interesting. And the Word was God, and... He was in the beginning with God in the creation. All things were made through him, the word, and without him nothing was made that was made, the word. And here I'm going to give you the saddest verse in all of the Bible, in my opinion, is John chapter 1, verse 10. And it applies to some lives here today. Jesus was in the world, the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That is the saddest verse. He created the world. He was among them, and they didn't even recognize who he was. But verse 12 goes on to say, but as many as received him, that's what you need to do is receive the gift. To as many as received him, gave he power to become the sons of God, children of God, to those who believe in his name. And the word, verse 14, became flesh, human body, and dwelt among us, and we looked at his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Merry Christmas or Happy Saturnalia, you choose. And this is the final push right here. And listen carefully. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The fact of the matter is this, people. The Bible teaches us that to receive Jesus Christ, we must believe in him, and that belief must lead to faith. And faith always produces action. That's why Jesus says, you vote for me. He uses the word vote. You either vote yes for me or you vote no for me, but you must vote. But remember this. This is Christmas. It's not Target and Nordstrom's and everything else. Hang on, listen to the message. It's not. In fact, listen, you want to know what a real Christmas tree looks like? Listen carefully. You can wake the person up that's next to you. I want you all to listen to this. What does a real Christmas tree look like? Well, its trunk is squared. It's about three feet on each side. It stands about 15 feet tall. And it has only two branches, approximately 8 to 10 feet across. It's not very pretty to look at. I wouldn't buy it and put it in my house. It's awfully rough and splintery. Someone could get hurt even trying to pick up the thing or even carry it. It's an ugly kind of brownish, reddish color, like the way a skinned up knee looks after the blood dries. At the top of the tree, there's a star. Well, it looks more like a wreath 
with long, shiny spikes poking, poking out of it. And it has a strange decoration hanging from it. it. Sort of looks like a man, but it couldn't be a man. That's a Christmas tree. Isaiah, 3,000 years ago, 1,000 years before Christ was crucified, said, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be lifted up and extolled very high above the people, and there, are, there will be many who will be appalled at his sight. His appearance will be more disfigured than any man, and his form will be marred beyond human resemblance. And so he shall sprinkle nations with his blood, and kings will hold their mouth when they look at him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. But he was pierced for our sins, and he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that was due to us was laid upon him, and by his wounds we have been made whole. All we like sheep have gone astray to our own way. But the Lord God laid on him the rebellion, or the suffering for the rebellion of us all. Three thousand years before the baby was born. How do you figure that? How do you reconcile that? It's not a Christmas tree that's green, an everlasting life, evergreen tree. It's a rotten, splintery, wicked cross decorated with a human being where 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifested in the flesh. And he was seen by angels. God coming in human form. And so I want to issue this warning right now and we'll be done. I'm going to ask you to be thinking in a moment, but I'm going to tell you in advance so that you'll know it's the Holy Spirit and not this church, me, or what you ate for breakfast. In a moment, you're going to feel a little uncomfortable. I don't care who you are, what financial status you might occupy, what position you have, in a moment you will feel uncomfortable if the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And he will. I tell you that in advance so that you'll listen and you judge. I told you that in the beginning. This service might be like no other. You're going to feel a sensation of struggle on the inside. You're going to feel like your seat got a little bit warmer. You're going to be a little bit upset because usually you shoot the messenger that's connected to the message. That's okay. It's my job. And I love it. But you feel a little uneasy. But you're going to need to recognize that you have broken the law and that you need this gift. And the next thing you need to do is change your thinking, the way you've thought about Jesus Christ. He's not some kind of an icon hanging on the wall. He's God knocking on the door of your heart asking you if you let him in. And the final thing is that you're going to need to actually ask him into your heart. Don't think for a moment that Jesus was a Baptist, a Methodist, a Pentecostal, or a Catholic, or that he attended Calvary Chapel of Nazareth. We cannot be that ignorant or that arrogant. He did all this before these things were ever made by men. We can't be that naive. The Bible tells us to understand that justification before God comes by faith in his Son alone. This week a man died that I highly respect his intelligence and I just disdain his wisdom because he had none. Carl Sagan died this week. The man who took astronomy and brought it right down into our living rooms. And he died an atheist. Actually, he died a new age worshiper of pagan gods, alien gods. Carl Sagan died the other day, and if Carl Sagan could speak to you right now, he would say, worship the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Let's bow our heads and pray right now. Here's the test to what we warned you of. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, before we pray, consider this. Paul the Apostle says, we then as workers together with Jesus Christ plead with you now to not receive the grace of God in vain. That's this message and the hope that it brings. For he says, 
an acceptable time I have now heard you, and in the day of salvation I will help you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Lord, in Jesus' name we come before you, and God, we pray that you will touch the hearts of those who today will either say yes to Jesus Christ or to say no, and there's no middle ground. There's no absentee ballots. There is no abstaining that today... In a moment's time, we could all enter eternity, but on this earth, what would be our vote now? Your seat's going to warm up when I tell you that I'm going to ask you in a moment to cast that vote. And then I'm going to give the Christian the opportunity to, work, to raise his hand in voting on this beautiful day. And I don't want anybody looking around. But you will vote today. And if you think that sends uneasiness into your heart, what will it be on the day when it says he will come to separate the sheep from the goats? Father, in Jesus' name, descend upon this body of people here today. Lord, we ask you, God, that you would just speak now to the hearts. If this morning you don't know where you would go if you die today, you can have all the PhDs and have all the acclaim of a Carl Sagan and wind up in a Christless eternity. Where are you going? Mary, she rejoiced in the Magnificat and she says, as she worships God her Savior, she knew. You can know today. And all the people that Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. The Bible says if you believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and confess that truth with your mouth, you will be saved. It's not church membership, it's not what you do. Have you ever done that? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11, have you done that? In this holy moment, if you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, while no one's looking around, please have respect. Raise your hand and I'll pray for you. And then I'll lead you later in a prayer. God bless you and God bless you and the other. And here's what I warned you about. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you are born again. You know the Holy Spirit lives in you. Put your hand up. Father, in Jesus' name, we lift our hands to you in praise and adoration to the gift that was given. And today we reaffirm the truth of the matter that we receive this gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that is through faith in him alone that we receive him. Lord, today we dedicate our lives to you again. We ask you to baptize us in the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might walk in grace and truth. Put your hands down. To those of you who accepted Christ this morning, pray this prayer. It's not the prayer that saves. It's the one who you're crying out to that saves. Christians, help them along. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Put your Holy Spirit within me. And write my name in your book of life. I believe you died and rose again for me. And I receive you today as my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me.